But here we are um, in Mantova, or, you know, nearly in Mantova, just on the outskirts. Federico II Gonzaga. Thank you, Wikipedia. Um, and so Federico, you know, only lived to be 40 years old, and he spent most of his childhood as a hostage. And there's a beautiful painting of him by Francia as a child when he was a hostage. He was the son of Isabella d'Este, and Francesco was it, Gonzaga, um, who was the Marquis of Mantova at the time. He was being made a duke by um, the emperor, by Charles V, so he wanted a, a good place, you know, to give a really big party to celebrate. And, and, and I have a feeling, didn't the emperor go there and, and he was entertained there? He got Giulio Romano to come to Mantova and, and stay there for sort of 15 years or something, who had been one of Raphael's assistants, a, a complete genius and, you know, great painter and designer and architect and everything. And, 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 of course, what's always fascinating for me about these Renaissance designers and, and architects and people is the amount of their work that's completely disappeared because, obviously, they had spent quite a lot of time designing things like cakes and wedding decorations, you know, and all that sort of thing. I'm sure a lot of their time was spent on food, you know. <laughs> and also, of course, all the designs for silver, ceramics and things, and which they did quite a lot of. And there are so few surviving drawings, of course, because they were... You know, the drawings were working drawings and they were handed over. And then the things were melted down later on because nobody was interested. So actually, you know, we, we see the incredible amount of work that they produced that, that survives. But then there's this whole other lot. Imagine all the other things. It's a square, amazing, um, sort of party palace, really. Not really meant for living in at all. It was just really meant for entertaining. And it's just full of architectural jokes by Giulio Romano. Um, who's constantly playing with the fact that none of it is actually stone. It's all brick with stucco on top. And so he could basically do whatever he liked. Um, and, and he was not somebody who believed in um, the classical canon of architecture. He believed with, in, in joking about it. And so he must have it, driven people absolutely nuts at the time um, because he was so irreverent. And he was constantly doing things like the slipped triglyph um, which on the top left of the picture here, you can see this thing falling down. And so all, as I said, in, in stucco. And this is, this is, I think it's been restored here from the time of the other photograph. So it's looking a bit too clean, really. But there's a couple of those slipped triglyphs. Here's another one. That's before it was restored. They look rather nicer. Um, that's the first time I went. Now, it, this is one of the fireplaces. And there we've got Federico Gonzaga II, Marchese di Mantova. And here's some of the stucco work, incredibly modern for the time, for sort of, it's about 1520 or something. And here's the ceiling in that same room. And so there's a lot of very irreverent humour going on. And one can imagine that actually parties there were probably a bit of a nightmare. And I suppose probably lots of drinking games and rather unfortunate practical jokes and... I'm sure that everybody ended up, you know, being slightly humiliated. This is the room of, of the horses, and these were Federico's favourite horses. And so, uh, I mean, it's a, the, one of the best bits of trompe l'oeil ever, ever created, really. And obviously the lower bit of the wall um, would have been covered in, in tapestries or fabric of some sort. And so that's all, all plain all the way through. And then only the upper part is painted. Um, but the painting is just unbelievably fantastic isn't it wonderful with these two two great niches with very convincing sculptures inside but you can you know it's pretty clear that it is trompe l'oeil and then you've got this horse that is absolutely convincing i mean you don't have the slightest suspicion that that's not a real horse and they're actually faithful portraits of his favorite horses and they even know you know the names of some of them and then this is the ceiling in that room, Federico's emblems. So that's a sort of a mount with something on the top of it. I don't know what, you know, they all mean something. And then he's got salamanders everywhere, I think because um, he was a hostage of Francois Premier for uh, two or three years to, to guarantee that the Gonzagas would support the French um, in the designs in Italy. And so he probably 
was allowed by Francois Premier to borrow his salamander. And so this, this I think, was the room for eating him, because it's all, it's all about eating and the feast of the gods. And then they've got these, you know, rather wonderful floors with these sort of labyrinth designs and all sorts of different designs, and they're done in a kind of mosaic, but they're nothing to do with the original house, 18th century even, I think, or even later. But they, they, they are very beautiful. And the original floors would probably have been either just plain terracotta tiles or decorated terracotta tiles, and those extraordinary decorated terracotta tiles that they did at the time that most people had. And certainly Isabella d'Este had a lot of those, so probably her son did too. Some of the fantastic painted Feast of the Gods. It's just the most wonderful combination of architecture and painting and storytelling and fantasy and everything. It is marvellous. And then the whole room is designed at, around the painted narrative and with this incredible architectural structure going up that then is made part of the painting. Those massive brackets that are clearly meant to be holding up the roof that are, are then just supported with a little bit of greenery. And so it's all these sort of visual jokes. A tableware above a door looking through into the next room. One of these fantastic fireplaces. An amazing stucco on the wall above. Look at that plasterwork. And this plasterwork is framing these sort of oculi looking onto scenes, and they're all obviously from mythology, and they're very relevant. And there's a carefully thought through programme in every room demonstrating all of the qualities and virtues of the ruler. He's got his name on, on the soffit of the door frame. Here's, oh, another salamander, do you see, crawling down um, the hood of the fireplace in this room. And here, just more. And then this is a, a, a fantastic loggia that opens out onto the fish ponds. There's a sculpture set in niches and fantastically detailed columns. And there's one of the fish ponds on the right there. And so you cross a little sort of little sort of bridge across the fish ponds. And fish ponds were frightfully important because obviously then you get fresh fish. And so they would actually, you know, it was part of the sort of thing of a, a villa in the Renaissance was having your fish ponds so that your guests, I, I suppose, would see that the fish was fresh, um, which was quite exciting, but also, of course, a fantastic status symbol to have all sorts of exotic fish ready to eat in your fish ponds next to the house. One of my favourite bits. This is a, a, a little lodger and this little secret garden, which is often a, a corner of the garden, and it's just a divine little tiny space. And at some point, obviously, somebody put a, put a wall to wall it in. You can see those holes on the columns where the probably metal frame was for that wall, but luckily it's been removed now. And there are these fantastic pebble mosaic floors which I imagine are, are, are later, but they are very, very pretty. And it's a really good, you know, tiny size. It's fantastic. And then the detail of the painting in there is just wonderful. And they, this is not, I think, um, Giulio. I think this is later. And this is somebody, or I think it's, maybe it's his time and it was somebody who was part of his team and then went on and decorated another house, which I might, we, we might look at that next time, somewhere near Parma. Um, and people from, from here went there and did very similar um, stucco work and painting. But I love these grotesques. Look at this with these tigers, tigers and babies. Such a good combination. And then here's some story from Aesop or something framed with these wonderful painted stucco decorations. And then looking from the lodger, there's this little sort of grotto house opposite. And so the, it's a whole courtyard um, that was all decorated in Trompe-Loy and the Trompe-Loy has gone, um, but the stucco remains. And then this grotto entrance, which I think is, is, is a later thing again. I think that's a hundred years later or something. Um, but, but it must have been completely wonderful, mustn't it? And I'm sure this had water pipes built into the fringe of, of the, the, the grotto work there. And so there would have been water dripping all over this and plants and everything. 
And there it is again, the contrast between the grotto stone and the very finished stucco above is very good, isn't it? And then here's the interior of that. And so again, I think, I think that is quite a lot later. I think that's 1590 or something. And then I've just got a very few pictures. We've just got time um, in the Palazzo Ducale. And the awful thing is that I, I'm lost. Um, I've lost all my pictures of the Palazzo Ducale, so I've only got these ones. But in Mantova, so leaving Palazzo Te, now, of course, it's pretty much central, but it, it was outside the city wall. It was in the landscape. The central, um, you know, the actual uh, ducal palace, the Palazzo Ducale, um, has, it's got one room with this fantastic labyrinth ceiling. And so this is a massive ceiling, um, huge coffers, and it, and it says, forse que si, forse que no, all the way around. Like, maybe yes, maybe no. And it's absolutely enormous, you know. It's, it's, it's the most beautiful thing. And then the actually most beautiful thing, of course, is the most famous room in in Mantova, um, and, and you know, one of the most famous rooms in the world, the Camera. It's, it's known as the Camera degli Sposi, which is completely incorrect. Um, it, it's really the Camera Picta, the painted room, um, and, and it had nothing to do with a wedding, I think. It was just the sort of the best room, you know. And this is painted by Andrea Mantegna, and so it's a generation before. Um, or two generations before even, what is it, 1480 or something. But it is just incredible. And it, it's painted as a square room, sort of cubic room, and, and it has this sort of gilded kind of vault um, with then this, you know, fictive opening in, in the middle looking through at the sky. And, you know, there are Caesars in um, these roundels in the vault. They restored it. They have restored it enough and so they ought to do you know that the, the arched um, opening there above that there's a sort of a horizontal rail which the Mantegna's painted curtains hang from and above that rail ought to be sky but they don't restore the sky there I don't know why it's idiotic and I, I once spent um, a, about an hour <laughs> recolouring this picture and, and putting putting sky in there. Um, but I've lost that picture very sadly, so I've only got the one that I haven't recoloured. But it, it completely transforms it when you see it like that because you then realise that it's actually this arched pavilion with the sky seen through the arches and those horizontals, which at the moment kind of, you know, impact on the architecture. But it is the most beautiful room in the world. And it's... You know, these are terrible photographs. So for God's sake, go and see it in reality. And they're all of the suit, you know. The Gonzaga family and the allies and their friends and their courtiers. And everyone was recognisable. And then there were these wonderful cherubs holding up um, a plaque over the door. And the people are always standing on the door frames, which always helps in trompe l'oeil. There is Mantegna. Do you see his little face just underneath mine? which is obviously a little bit of wit. And I think there was some sort of a joke with the client that, you know, I'll, I'll put myself in, you'll never spot me, or something like this. And then here, and these were the, you know, the favourite dog. Actually, no, I don't think those are the favourite dogs. I think the favourite dogs are on the other wall. There you can see the sky going up um, above that rail. The short lady there is, 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 I think, one of the court dwarves, and they had, they had one or two court dwarves who were always very popular at the time. I look for the photographs, and they're too bad to even show you, but the photographs of what my father was always fascinated by. My father was always um, obsessed with the idea that there was, there was this dwarves' apartment in, in the city palace in, in Mantova. And in fact, of course, it's not a dwarves' apartment at all. It's actually um, a, a pilgrimage thing that the, you know, one of the sons was so obsessively religious that he was determined to have his own version of something called the Hundred Steps or something, which is a pilgrimage staircase. And so you have to you have to crawl on your knees on this staircase, and so there's this tiny little thing 